29.10 sub 5. Um, uh, Fran Arsenault and Himogen Nagaretti will be participating remotely during the meeting due to a geographic distance of greater than 20 miles via video conference. Please note that a quorum is physically present. Uh, a roll call vote is required for any and all votes involving members participating remotely. So um, uh, uh, welcome everyone and um, I will start as usual with uh, resident concerns. Is there anyone in the room who would like to make a comment? And anyone um, online who'd like to make a comment, please raise your electronic hand. I don't see anyone, and so uh, we'll move on. And I don't have any updates uh, um, this morning, uh, this evening. Uh, uh, I made the same mistake that Lisa made earlier. Um, uh, uh, and the next update will be uh, uh, from the town manager. Uh, John, please. Uh, good evening. Nice to see everybody uh, back in person here in the Faulkner room. Uh, just a few updates. I uh, just wanted to mention if you've driven by, you, you may have noticed that the new fire station is in service. Uh, we moved the staff in on the 24th of February, and uh, they're getting acquainted with the facility and, and providing uh, service to North Acton uh, in an enhanced way. Um, there will be a formal ribbon cutting ceremony this spring after we finish the landscaping um, outside the building. Uh, we're starting the process to implement an online permitting system. And uh, we're working with an internal working group on what that looks like. And we have uh, some input from the Economic Development Committee, which was very helpful as we proceed in that uh, project. I'll be going to the CPC tomorrow night to talk about the ASA Parliament House stabilization project. It's a very important project. Uh, the board set it as a number one priority uh, this year. And uh, I want to just uh, reiterate some of the project changes that have taken place since the initial application was submitted to the CPC and also demonstrate how the project is consistent with what was approved uh, in 2019 annual town meeting. Also tomorrow night, thanks to virtual meetings, I'll be at the HDC as well. Um, and that we'll be talking with uh, Corey York, Director York will be there primarily uh, to talk about the final plans for the reconstruction of the Acton Town Center and just make sure the HDC is, com HDC is comfortable with uh, what we're doing with the horse trough and some other elements of the of the project. Uh, note on your calendar, the MBTA um, housing discussion is, is scheduled for the board's next meeting on 321, or the next regular meeting, as, I guess I should say. Uh, there'll be a sewer commissioner's workshop uh, next week. Uh, I believe it's, uh, check your calendar. It's a, it's a workshop, a midday workshop for the board. Uh, the local, local elections coming up March 29th. Check the website for details on that. And I just wanted to mention that through uh, this year, the state revenues were stronger than projected. And, uh, you know, at the MMA, there's a lot of talk about uh, pushing our legislators and the governor to, to increase local aid. And there's going to be a public hearing on that uh, by the legislature's Joint Committee on Ways and Means on May 15th. I'm sorry, March 15th. And I know some people will be advocating for more uh, local aid at that meeting. I also wanted to mention that a group of employees went to the Women Leading Government Conference last Thursday and uh, learned a lot about uh, leadership, and it was a great uh, experience for them. And one final thing, um, you may see people walking around Town Hall, or we're doing a, a staff walking challenge. If you see a bunch of employees out there, there's not a walkout going on. Uh, it's actually uh, to promote wellness and exercise. Thank you. Um, does any member have a member minute they'd like to, or anything they'd like to bring up? Uh, Jim, please. Just a short one. Um, Energize Acton, which is a joint project of the Town of Acton and the Acton Climate Coalition, is sponsoring a movie night this Friday uh, at 6.30. Uh, you can check it out at the energizeacton.org website for a sign-up link. It's the movie 2040, which uh, is an optimistic uh, movie about climate change. So it's just, who would have thought? So it's, it should be fun. Excellent. Uh, any other members? Hi, Himager. If you're talking, we can't hear you. No, we're 
not hearing you. I don't know if that's an issue local to the room or whether it's... Um, And the, and, the, and the speaker here is on. Uh, for, yeah, Fran, could you just try saying something? To just to make sure to see if we have a speaker problem in the room. You're muted still, Fran, so you just have to unmute and then speak. No, we can't hear you either. So um, I, I will come back to you, um, uh, uh, Himager. Um, um, I'm going to just try to get uh, through a couple things where we um, uh, don't need um, input, and I'll have to pause at the at the first vote. Um, okay. So the, the the first thing for item three, um, the gas main petition, um, the petitioners uh, requested a uh, to postpone to um, uh, April fourth. Uh, so we won't even be opening um, that hearing tonight. Um, the next item is the um, sewer privilege fee request. Um, uh, uh, John, do you have um, a summary of that? I mean, I think I know the details. I could also do it. And when we get to a vote, we'll have to see whether we have audio there or not. Uh, yes, this is a request through the engineering department um, who, facil who received the request from a, a property owner uh, seeking to connect to the sewer system. I don't. I, there's more details in the packet. I, I know a little bit more, and so it's it's an accessory dwelling, um, and the way our 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 uh, privilege fees work is uh, a, a house or a unit uh, with three bedrooms or more is a full betterment unit or privilege unit, um, and one with two bedrooms or or fewer um, is two thirds of a betterment unit, and so this is an accessory dwelling that has two bedrooms. And, and therefore, it's two thirds of the the privilege unit, um, which is uh, um, uh, uh, twenty thousand dollars. So uh, uh, two thirds of um, uh, the thirty thousand dollar privilege unit. Um, any any comments from members of the board in the room? Sure. Um, there's also a request to uh, reduce the payment by from twenty thousand down to ten thousand. Um, which makes a lot of sense to me, given the fact that this is just a small accessory dwelling unit. But I would love to hear if there was any, you know, analysis by by staff about whether that made sense and whether there would be any, um, uh, whether if we think this is a good idea to treat accessory dwelling units differently, which makes sense to me, uh, we might want to update our regulations to make that clear. I don't have anything to report on that, uh, although it is a good suggestion and something we can certainly look into. So it, it might um, uh, make sense to do in, um, uh, in some case, but I think we'd want to do it overall for one bedroom units, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's not the way it is now and it hasn't been since we started the sewer district. So um, the, um, that that's something we could consider at a at a future time, but that's not the case right now. Um, what, what I'm going to do um, right now is to, to let a member of the public speak and see if we can hear them. Um, and if we can hear the members of the public, then I may have actually have um, the two remote members dial in on their phones. But we'll we'll see, we'll see where we we are here with the two uh, remote members. Um, Justin, would you call on the remote members, please? The remote, sorry, the remote so participants. And I will say that from home, we could hear um, them speaking. So it, it might be just the room audio. I think Mark might be looking into that. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yeah, someone who's requesting a reduction uh, for the accessory dwelling unit. And uh, I'm actually, before that, asking about. Um, having the uh, sewage hookup to my house uh, instead of having a separate sewage hookup. Um, so I'm not just really requesting a reduction, I'm requesting that uh, I change the idea of having a separate hookup. I mean, I don't know why that would be okay. So I'm bringing that up. I think it's in the, it's in the uh, request, the formal request. I'm not sure I've heard you say 
understand that, but um, okay, great. Yeah, so that would be my first my first request. Okay. Um, why don't you complete b both your requests and then um, uh, and then we'll discuss those. Okay. Well, the, the first request and then the second is to uh, reduce it because it's only one bedroom. Okay. Um, oh, it's only one bedroom. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. sorry. I thought I. I, 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 I thought I, I thought I. Um, uh, oh, oh, okay. Um, so I, in the ca in the case of the um, c connecting it through her house, um, I assume that that would be uh, a board of health decision, not a decision here. Oh. Right. I, okay. I, I, um, I, I don't think that we would decide whether, you know, uh, if, you know, if you have, let's say, a four inch pipe running from your house, whether that's enough or, or whatever. So I. I uh. Uh, anyway, I, I don't think that we would make that decision. Um, we, we would make the decision only on um, the connection and the cost of the, allowing you to connect and the cost of the connection. So, so um, yeah, how would I go about um, asking the Board of Health about that then, and then maybe returning here? I'm not sure how it looks Yeah, we, we, we might have to return back. Um, so, uh, um, I, I, uh, John, I don't know if you have any, any comments on that. Yeah, um, I think if if the request before the sewer commissioners is clear, uh, action could be taken tonight. But if it isn't, then I think we'd have to come back. Okay. Um, could it be maybe stated that if the Board of Health denies uh, my being able to connect it to the current hookup, then um, you could talk about the reduction to one bedroom? Uh, for the sewage fee. Um, uh, sh sh well, 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 we'll get to that. So, um, are you are you done with um, your comments? Um, uh, well, I'm asking a question. Do we really need to go to the board of health before I find out? Uh, what whether or not you'll be able to approve a one bedroom reduction fee. So, the, um, we'll we'll discuss that at the, at the end. So. Um, Okay, so we'll um, move, I'm going to move forward and take more questions and, and comments, and then um, we'll, we'll discuss at the end because we, we have other things to discuss here. So, as far okay. as. We're, we're, um, I just have one more question. How do I ask the Board of Health? Uh, is this an Acton entity or some other entity? It, 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 it is an Acton entity, and I'm not sure that it's the right one, but I would contact the town manager's office after the meeting for, okay. um, for guidance. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, um, does either, either Fran or Himager, do you want to try to speak again? Just to see if we can get you. Sure, testing. Yes, we can, we can hear you. So, um, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to come back to your member minutes after this agenda item. So r right now, do you have any comments on this before I take the, the other, um, uh, caller? Okay. Uh, uh Justin, can you move, move ahead and, and ask, uh, continue to call on the online comments? Absolutely. We have a call-in user one. Hi, it's Tara from West Acton, and um, I came in a little bit late, and I'm a little bit confused. Is this is not the 242 Parker Street privilege to see your request? Yes, it is. It is. I thought that this was the Parker Village with 68 units, and is that I must be mistaken. This is a single unit? This is an accessory dwelling at an existing house. Okay, so um, my question is, um, if is there going to are we going to be talking about the um, the Parker Street, the multiple units, the sixty eight units? No. Right. No. Uh, okay, so the single unit at three forty two Parker Street. My question is, um, if the hookup, I thought what? Yeah, go ahead, please. So the hookup, as far as I'm, I, I, I know, that the SBUs are per unit, correct? Because the units could end up with more bedrooms later. 
but an accessory dwelling unit would always be limited to one building. I, I, I mean, if we change the zoning, then all, all of a sudden you can have as many buildings as many bedrooms as you want. Um, but I'm just a little confused about the fairness. Um, and uh, but I, I'd like to accommodate her request. I just want to be sure that we aren't um, making a mistake relative to the fairness of all the other people that made their betterment. So the, the way it works now is for it's by unit. If the unit has three bedrooms or more, it's one privilege unit. If it's two bedrooms or fewer, it's two thirds of a privilege unit. And the privilege unit is thirty thousand dollars. So it's it's in, do, in dollars. It's thirty thousand dollars for three bedrooms or more, or um, twenty thousand dollars for two bedrooms or fewer. Okay. And then my other question is that if somebody gets the two bedrooms or fewer, the two thirds or even reduced more, I don't even know if there's precedent for that, but assuming that they got a discount for the number of units, what if later on they decide to have more bedrooms? Um, I, that, that changes the connection fee, right? So um, uh, they, they would have to get a permit for that and that would be checked, right? They need a building permit. So that would be an additional, additional betterment unit at some future time? Y yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Justin, please go, go ahead and, and um, um, call on Joan um, Houlihan last so that um, uh, we, can, we can have her putting some questions before we deliberate. Okay, uh, Alyssa Nicole is up next. Hi, this is Alyssa Nicole um, from School Street. And um, while I understand that this is um, an expensive um, item in a project. In, in terms of fairness, I think it's ill-advised to waive or reduce a privilege fee because you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of, of residents and businesses that are in the existing district who have already paid betterment fees and I wonder how many of, of those um, residents have accessory dwelling units that they had to pay a two-thirds SBU for already. Um, if the sewer commissioners did decide to reduce or waive this fee for this applicant, I think that going um, required to do so for any future applicant. Um, in, in terms of fairness. And I understand that this is a one bedroom accessory dwelling unit, but more than one person could potentially end up um, in, the, in the unit in the future. And, and I don't believe that the answer to um, Tara's question about an additional bedroom being added on would have to go back for an additional fee because the the, S, the two thirds SBU is determined by the size of the apartment, and you can you know renovate uh, an apartment and, and add an additional bedroom. You can renovate a house and add an additional bathroom. So I, I think that the the cost of, of the project um, for for any um, person or company who decides to to do a uh, the work that would add an accessory dwelling unit on their property should just just incorporate into the cost of the project the sewer privilege fee if they're in the district. Thank you. Thank you. And Justin, can you call on Joan, Joan uh, Houlihan and then uh, then we'll uh, dis the members will discuss it. Absolutely, Joan, you're back up. Oh, okay. Um, and what was the Oh, you, you just had your you just had your hand up. Did you have another question or comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I actually didn't. Oh, okay. That that's fine. I've done that. I've done that myself. Okay. It's a pandemic hazard. Um, okay. Th thank you. Um, so, um, comments from uh, members on the situation, Dean. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I I'm inclined to be sympathetic to the idea about reducing the fee, but I, I don't think we should do it on a one-off basis. I think it might be a, 
a good subject for discussion uh, at a later date, uh, maybe even the sewer workshop that we're talking about that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, one of the ideas, and this is why town meeting and the planning board approved the idea of the accessory dwelling units, is to try to pr produce some fairly inexpensive housing. Um, so for that reason, yeah, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the idea about a $10,000 fee for a one-bedroom unit. But I think we really need to think about all the ramifications of that. Um, I'd be interested as a related matter to hear from the appropriate folks here in Town Hall, you know, how many accessory dwelling units have been permitted recently and, and is that zoning change actually having an impact? I know uh, sewer impact would certainly be one of the things that would slow this down. So, uh, you know, in the, in the Seward area, that might be a good area to add some uh, accessory dwelling units. So, yep, I'm sympathetic to it, um, but I think we really need to have a larger discussion. Uh, Jim. Um, so first on the question of um, who needs to approve, uh, I'm reading um, Chin's memo that's in our packet. Uh, the current sewer use regulation requires a separate and independent building sewer for every building unless otherwise approved by the board. So uh, at least by her reading of the regulations, we do, have the, uh, we do have the ability to waive that requirement. And for me, this actually goes to the heart of why a reduction is reasonable. Um, if we, assuming that we go ahead and approve that they, um, you know, that they can run the sewer connection through the house. Um, as Chin points out, that's, um, we avoid having to cut into the pavement. Um, we don't have to make a new cut into the existing sewer main on Parker Street. In other words, this reduces our costs. Um, uh, to me, the, the one, one, there have not been a whole lot of accessory dwelling units permitted in the town of Acton. Um, so I, it's, it's still a new thing for us, but for me, the whole notion of accessory dwelling unit is that this is, an, this is in a sense, part of the same, um, this is part of the same ownership structure. It's part of the same uh, building lot. It's, uh, to me, it's more useful to think of this as, you know, um, a, 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 a multi-bedroom house, and one of the rooms happens to be, uh, you know, at, in a slightly separate location on the lot. So, um, to me, having a reduction, uh, not having a, a, a total, you know, extra twenty thousand dollars makes sense to me. The proposal here to s simply charge ten thousand does make sense to me. Thank you, um, Fran or Hemija. Fran. I just talk on I echo what Jim and Dean uh, said. I, I could be open to a reduction in this case, especially am I uh, to understand the house is already hooked up to sewer? Yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, especially for the square footage, it being only 780 square feet, that is a one bedroom, if it at all. So I, I would be completely open to that. And I, I think this would help encourage accessory apartments as well. Hamija, hey, do you have a comment? Um, nothing, okay, I just want to echo what um, Fran mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'll say that I'm, I'm mixed here, right? Um, I'm fine with it being hooked up to the house, but I would want to postpone that from tonight because I'd want to understand that um, um, the, uh, the connection is being done in a way that the uh, sewage couldn't back up from one structure into the other structure. Um, um, and usually, in, uh, you know, when it goes into a, um, uh, you know, the lower, larger sewer pipe in the street, um, it drops down and so it can't really back up. Um, so um, I, would, I would like to understand that, and, and like, but I have no problem with that. Um, it doesn't, however, change our costs. Um, the, the homeowner is responsible for poking it to the, um, the um, sewer main in the street. Um, the privilege fee is designed to have, for us to have the capacity to, to um, uh, pro process the sewers. So it, it goes into, you know, for, for, for maintenance and operating costs of the, um, 
uh, the wastewater treatment plant and the infrastructure to get the you know the, the mains and pumps and everything to get the sewers through town and just because these two buildings are close I don't see that as a justification for the reduction and I, I agree with Dean in that um, I don't uh, think we should do this as a one-off if we want to change the policy m maybe um, but that, that doesn't help uh, uh, Ms. Houlihan but we have apartment complexes where the one-bedroom apartments get charged two-thirds of a betterment unit um, and we, we don't try to add them up and say well some houses have four bedrooms so we'll take four apartments and it's one betterment unit so where, where we calculate the betterments the, the betterments in apartments are ca calculated the same way so if there if it's a three-bedroom account apartment it's a uh, full unit and if it's two bedrooms or fewer it's two-thirds and we've used that before and it's I think unfair to say in this one case we're going to you know have the cost and we didn't do it for all the others and if we're going to do it for all the others we really have to think about the math of supporting um, the infrastructure to move pump and process sewerage so um, I, I am I, I, provided that the engineering is good I'm okay with you know so she doesn't have to dig another trench to the street and um, find another stub in the in the main to hook it to I'm fine with going through the house but I think it should we should keep the 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 pricing the way we had it um, uh, because we're, uh, often even if there's one bedroom I mean all these things are approximate right because in a one bedroom apartment there's often two people right and we you know we don't try to count the number of people so these are rounded numbers and to say that a, I don't think it's actually correct that uh, a one bedroom produces half the flow of a two bedroom, mm -hmm. right? I think it's probably two thirds of the flow. And again, if we're nickel and diming ourselves, um, then we don't have enough money to maintain the, the, the sewer infrastructure. So, um, and to, to go further, um, in most cases, when you put an accessory, accessory dwelling unit, if you, didn't, you weren't on the sewer system, you would have to expand your septic system. Right, your your tank might not be big enough, or your field might not be big enough uh, for the additional flow, and that's going to cost you twenty thousand dollars. You know, our 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 the the privilege fees are set um, so that they it, um, they cover. It's of course the rounded numbers, but it costs uh, the the amount of money it costs us to expand the system or um, uh, expand the. Uh, uh, you know the, the 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 amount of sewage we process and ma maintain that system, um, and it's about the same as what it would cost if you did it privately uh, f through a septic system. So it's it's you know it's very close, and I I I, I don't I, I'm not in favor of uh, um, um, lowering the fee. Um, so um, I'll check back with uh, Ms. Hulingan here in a in a minute, but our Member is okay with postponing this decision if she if she wants for to, until our next meeting so we can get a, a reading on hooking it through um, the house, uh, Jim. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I might suggest we take uh, the single vote on the first on the um, uh, the separate and independent. You know, having the having it run through the house, or do, would you want to wait on that too until you have well, that, more? Well, th that's the thing. I think we need to wait on. Okay. Fine. Um, I'm fine with uh, waiting a few years. I'm fine with actually voting tonight to allow her to connect, mm -hmm. um, but it would be the connection to the street, mm -hmm. um, and then. But I thought we just do it all. all yeah, that makes time. sense. Thank you. Um, and is there? Um, and what, what's the feeling? Uh, the overall feeling with uh, re the reduction. Um, how do people want to vote there? Um, J uh, Dean. Yeah, I, if we're asking for a decision for tonight. I would defer to the chair. Um, you've studied this a lot closer than I have. Um, if we want to have a lo larger discussion at some later point and look at a reduced fee, why that's fine. But I think at this point, um, having heard your comments, David, I'd probably say that we should stick with the, with the two thirds fee, the 20,000. Um, know, as you say, I, I do think there's probably a larger discussion that could be had at some point. And, and we, um, she will save if, if, if it's feasible to connect through the house or to the house's pipe in the yard, um, 
uh, that will save her considerable money because um, uh, it's it's not cheap to dig the trench out to the street and cut the street and repave the street. Um, so, um, uh, Justin, could you let uh, Ms. Houlihan uh, speak again, please? Yeah, um, yeah, this is all. I understand um, the points of view here. Um, so, my question is, the privilege fee, it sounds like, would be the same even if I uh, was able to connect it to the house. Is that what you're saying? Or, but because there's no digging and all of that involved, it would be lower? Um, not sure what's... He, he, what's being said here about about the difference between connecting it individually and connecting it to the street that's my first question so the the connecting it to your house or probably more likely to the pipe outside your house um, yeah. uh, provided that's feasible engineering wise would it likely is um, there might need to be I mean I don't know all, all the details here there might need to be some kind of backflow prevention or what what I don't know what the, what the, yeah. the the requirements are would likely be would likely save you thousands of dollars from depending I don't know the layout of your land right, where, right. Where, if the pipe is on one side of your house and the accessory unit is on the other side of your house I, I, I can't say that but it's it, it likely would save you quite a bit of money um, Right. Um, I understand that, but I, what I don't understand is the kind of flat fee that you're talking about, this privilege fee. Um, does that stand no matter what, no matter where, uh, how I get it connected? Y yes. And, and it's the same thing as if it was an apartment building, right? I mean, if you have it come mm -hmm. in in one pipe, which apartment buildings all do, that doesn't, yeah. mean, that doesn't mean there's it's all one unit, right? So if we had a, in a, in a, a small apartment block that had four one-bedroom units, that's four units. That's not a big house with four bedrooms. So that's twenty thousand dollars for each connection fee for each of those four units. That's correct. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I mean, for me, part of doing this has to do with finding out whether I can actually go ahead with the project um, and finding a way to do that. Finding a way to do that. And probably this is going to be my accessory dwelling apartment, right? Um, finding a way to do that involves being able to lower this fee. So um, I'm not. Sh I thought that maybe at least doing it through the existing system would relieve the 20 20k um, connection fee. But it sounds like you're saying no matter what, that 20k connection fee should hold. So, um, you know that yeah. we would have to vote. We, we would have to vote on that. So the, that fee holds if a majority of us vote that it right. holds, right? Um, right. Yeah, so, and that's a problem for me. And I understand about the fairness and about other people who have paid um, have paid twenty thousand. But you're talking about, for example, apartment complexes as opposed to a private homeowner of seventy five years old who wants to set up an accessory dwelling unit for herself, basically. So I mean, I understand that logically it makes sense that it should all be fair, but I also feel that there should be some consideration given to the differences in the requests and the differences in the usages. So right, but I I'm not I'm you know, not prepared to, you know, say that I need to apply for a hardship, and I won't do that. But I'm, I'm hoping that you'll consider difference in circumstances and and the value of having people be able, like me, to have an accessory dwelling unit on their own property um, at 75 years old, and I mean that's something that something that I've been hoping to do. Um, yeah. I, I can't do it. If it's going to be that much money, really. Well, th well, th thank you. What I what I would suggest, and if you would be open to this, is that w we um, put this on our agenda next time, and that'll yeah. give that'll give us time to look into um, connecting it uh, to the same outlet as the house, and give us all time to consider uh, what we might do with the the fee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and maybe we could maybe we could even split the difference, right, for this once, right? And maybe it could be fifteen thousand dollars or something. I'll pursue the board of health through the town manager, as you said. Yes, and it and it and it. And it may not be a Board of Health decision. Uh, as, as we were talking, um, uh, Member Star Snyder Grant looked, looked it up and says it, he says it's our decision, but I would wanna, it's, it's usually the, um, you know, uh, it's not us that looks at the engineering, and so I'd wanna make sure that it's, it's, it's connected properly. And so um, we'd have to find out what proper staff uh, would, would look at that. Okay, okay. Th thank you very much. Yeah. So um, no decision on that tonight, and uh, we, we will move um, uh, forward to our uh, forum on uh, whether to increase the Community Preservation uh, Act uh, sur surtax, sur uh, surtax or surcharge, used to, uh, which is used to fund affordable housing, historic preservation, open space, and recreation projects. Um, um, the, the town manager um, is going to make a short presentation and then um, we'll take um, input from, from folks and um, I'll give a little uh, guidelines at the beginning of the input of what we'd, you know, what's important for the board to hear from you. So, so uh, hold on just a second. Um, I think people remotely can see the town manager's presentation but people in the room cannot. So just, just give us a second there, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we're excited to be back in person, uh, but it's uh, some challenges with hybrid meetings have reemerged, um, and we're working our way through them. The good thing is, is that the select board members actually have a copy of this in front of them, and if the people at home can see it, there's only five people that we know of that can't. Um, so maybe we can just move forward. And um, I'll try to speak very, uh, well, you know, I'll try to explain it very closely. Does that work? The, 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 that, that's okay, and I can see it. And so if someone would, would like the, um, a copy, you can have mine. I can see it on the screen. So um, the, when this... When this discussion was placed on the agenda, uh, the chair asked me to just prepare a few brief slides just so that there's a general understanding of uh, what we're doing right now for the CPA surcharge and what the options look like for making changes to it. So uh, the CPC Coalition is a nonprofit that, <laughs> that uh, helps every community uh, manage its community preservation funds and its community preservation programs. And this is directly from their website. Um, the town in November of 2002 adopted a surcharge of 1.5%. It adopted a low income uh, exemption for after the first 100,000. Um, and at, when it was before the ballot, it looks like it received 55% uh, approval or um, majority. Uh, this is some history of the revenue that uh, we received from the CPA program, both the local surcharge amounts and then the percentage um, matches from the uh, state. And the number fluctuated through the years because we were an early adopter. Uh, and then recently, other, many other communities have come on board. I believe there's over 100 and there's 187 communities now that have community preservation and access to community preservation funds. But if you look at last year, uh, the local surcharge uh, brought in 1.1 million. Uh, 309,000 uh, from the state, and so 1.47 was available uh, for spending. Uh, to change the surcharge, it's a similar process that was used to adopt it. Uh, the, the surcharge change must be, on, must be placed on the ballot, and to place on a ballot, you can do that either through a vote of town meeting or through a petition that's signed by at least 5% of the voters in town. Uh, once it's on the ballot, it must receive a majority, a simple majority uh, of voters to uh, be effect, to be adopted. So some of the things that uh, you could do, and, and I, the CPA coalition helped us put this together and it's based on increasing um, the surcharge. Uh, if, it, if the surcharge were to be increased to 2%, for example, uh, there's a potential opportunity to uh, 
bring in more local revenue um, and also increases what's matched. And so the percentage change in total revenue is estimated at approximately 33% when you combine those two factors. Uh, if, the, if the surcharge were to go to 2.5% uh, with a combination of the local uh, revenue and the increase in state match, it's a 67% increase in available uh, funding. And then if you go to 3%, it, it actually opens the town up to additional matching rounds, which, which aren't guaranteed, but they, they happen uh, in some amount every year. Uh, but if the town went to 3%, it would be eligible for, uh, in the case of last year, three matching rounds. Uh, which would increase the total revenue by 104 percent on a hypothetical basis. So there are there are significant benefits if you look at what the state matches, uh, depending on what uh, amount the local surcharge is. But of course, every time you increase the surcharge, it costs local taxpayers more. Uh, the impact on a single family home, uh, in this case, a single family residence, uh, is valued at 665,000. Uh, with a tax rate of 19.45, annual taxes of just under 13,000. Um, after the 100K exemption, the net tax bill is, uh, the net impact of the 1.5% is $165 right now. Uh, the current cost uh, for a single family home is $165. And if we were to go to 2%, it would be $220. Uh, if it goes to 2.5%, it would be 275 3%, 330 which is about $55 or so uh, for every half of a percent increase in the surcharge. The single-family home cost goes up about $55 a year. That is the baseline data that I wanted to present. Uh, if there's any other questions, I'll do, do my best to answer them. Any, any questions from members of the board? Okay, um, the, main, the main purpose of, of this is to be able to hear um, from people um, what, what, they, what they think about this. Um, let, let, me, let me say um, two, uh, two things um, that we, we'd like to hear. Um, uh, first of all, whether you'd like us um, to increase the surcharge or not, and if you uh, and why in either case, you know, why you don't, why you do. Um, and, um, and if you do, uh, by how much? Um, uh, so uh, we, we can increase it um, in half percent, as, as uh, the town manager said, where the, the surcharge is a one and a half percent now, it can be increased to two, two and a half, or three. Um, if we go to three, there's a little bit more, um, uh, uh, matching funds from the, the state. Um, and each, with each half percent increment, uh, costs the average house about $55 a year. Um, so, um, and I'm gonna give everybody, because uh, I suspect that given the, uh, um, between the people here and the people uh, online, there might be a number of different, uh, a number of people who'd like to make a comment. And so I'm gonna limit them to, to two minutes. Um, and uh, we'll go for, um, 45 minutes if there are, are, are comment, enough comments to fill that time. So um, I'm going to first start with people in, in the room. Um, please, sir. And if, and if you'd like to speak in the room, please line up where that, that gentleman was, um, uh, because I'd, I'd, I'd rather not wait for people to, to walk up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Town Manager, for the explanation and uh, all the detail there. Uh, Joe Cooney, Dustin Lane. Uh, I'd like to speak in support of increasing the CPA surcharge percentage to 3%, especially for the preservation of open space in Acton. I certainly recognize the potential impact of an increased tax burden, particularly on those of low or moderate income. But as the town manager explained, there are some things that can mitigate that impact. First, the first $100,000 is excluded from the calculation. And second, for all those qualifying as low income and for seniors qualifying as moderate income, there's the, uh, they're completely, if they apply, they can be completely exempted. And so there's no impact of an increase because they're already not receiving the CPA surcharge. 
The use of Community Preservation Act funds has been a key enabler for many of the open space projects over the years. Uh, use of a dedicated funding pool enables the town to make credible offers to landowners who would otherwise be forced to sell to developers. Land prices, prices are increasing, making this more competitive. Open space, once developed, is lost often forever for its scenic beauty, climate resilience, wildlife habitat, and recreation potential. By participating in the Communi Community Preservation Act, we also get the bonus effect, as the town manager also mentioned, of the state match, which will add approximately an additional $500,000 this year or 44% uh, to funds, and has added uh, 6.8 million since we adopted the CPA. I urge the select board to bring this forward to town meeting at 3% so that we can join the 75 mass cities and towns like Ayer, Bedford, Groton, <coughs> Stowe, and Westford that are already at that rate and enjoying the benefits of protecting open space and investing in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else in the room would like to speak? Okay, um, uh, Justin, would you um, call on the online uh, participants, please? Yes, we have uh, Bill Aylesbury. Bill, you have to unmute yourself. There I'm you go. sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, Bill Aylesbury, 22 High Street, and 44-year uh, resident of Acton, and as a member of the Community Preservation Committee for more than five years, and currently serving as the vice chair, I've I've seen worst firsthand, you know, the transition from the easy years where supply and demand for CPC funding was pretty well in balance, and uh, to the more current years where uh, requests have exceeded uh, the funds available. But regarding the critical question, is now the time to increase the surcharge? My own answer is not yet, not now. And I say this for two reasons. First, having, having more applications than we have available funds has obliged the committee to intensify its project review and evaluation process. The committee has always been you know, very diligent in seeking answers to the two basic questions. Is this project worthy and is this project ready? But having more demand than supply of funds has forced us to dig deeper in, and to assess a number of things more fully, such as you know, the full breadth and depth of a project's community benefit, the clarity of the project's underlying design elements and features, and just as importantly, the completeness of its underlying cost estimates. As it's turned out over the last three years, that intensified inspection has allowed the committee to balance the supply and demand by reaching the conclusion that not all project applications are as ready or, or as worthy as, as the others. More money would not have necessarily been the best solution here. The fact that each year there's a new list of prior year's projects that return considerable funds due to scope reductions or high initial cost estimates is a testament to this very point. The second reason why I believe an increase in the surcharge is not warranted Quickly, at this Bill, time is that the committee is currently in the middle of a comprehensive research effort to compare its CPC practices with those of approximately 20 other towns across the Commonwealth. The, the only criteria we use is they've got to have been in the, in the CPA program for more than 10 years and they're arrayed at surcharge levels below 1.5% and of course all the way up to the maximum of three. Uh, but the objective is to identify best practices employed by these towns and to ensure that we gain the maximum use of the considerable funds we already have at our disposal. Thank you, Bill. Just a couple, a couple of the examples that Bill? we... Bill, I'm sorry, you're out of time. Thank you. Next, please, Justin. Uh, next up, we have Andrew McGee. Uh, yes, hi, uh, Andy McGee. Um, uh, and a line like court act and mass. Um, also chair of the open space committee. I, I want to speak very strongly in favor of raising the surcharge. Um, obviously I come to this from a perspective of open space preservation, but as the board knows, uh, we have several projects uh, in front of us that are coming to market, significant parcels of land that the development of which will have a, a significant impact on the visual character, if nothing else, of the town. 
Um, I think uh, several projects that if uh, they were to be developed would shock people as to uh, lands that they thought were protected that they drive by every day. Um, the problem is the CPA funding at the level we have right now is not adequate to cover those costs. Um, so an increase of 3% would do much toward helping us in the preservation of open space and the preservation of the character of our town. And as the um, uh, town manager alluded, we, we have the, uh, several benefits of the Community Preservation Act, one of which is every penny that we spend uh, on it, every penny of the surcharge stays in the town. It's not a tax that goes out to the state and then comes back to us. It is a, a charge that stays in the town. The other is, as been pointed out, is that we get a match from the state. So we get uh, a matching dollar amount. If we go to 3%, we go to about 46% match on those funds. And that will do a lot toward helping us to uh, protect the open space and, and the overall character of our town. So I would strongly support the select board uh, to support uh, the increase in the CPA funding and the, to do so at the 3% request. Um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Andy. Next up, we have Bob Van Meter. Thank you, and thank you to the board for the opportunity to speak. Um, I also strongly support increasing um, the amount uh, from 1.5% to 3%, although if the board in its wisdom decides that um, a smaller increase is, uh, is more prudent, I certainly would support that as well. But I think, I think the amount of money um, for many people in Acton is not uh, a, a terrific burden. And I speak as a 29 year resident who now officially qualifies as a senior citizen. Um, and uh, I, I would urge that we do this in part or in significant part to increase the resources available for affordable housing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next up we have uh, Franny Osmond. Um, hi, Franny Osmond, 16 Half Moon Hill. I am very much in support of increasing this to 3% um, for some of the similar reasons that I've heard. Um, specifically, I don't think the burden will be um, too much on the, those homeowners. I mean, I realize everything adds up, but the value that we get in quality of life from open space, housing, recreation, and historic preservation from the CPA is really, really important to our town. And I think we should take advantage of that added leverage that we get with that over 100% um, match or increase. Anyway, I, I do think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Bettina Abe. Hi, Bettina Abe, School Street. I'm in favor of increasing the community preservation surcharge from 1.5% to 2% to add more funding to very important projects I value. Open space for the health of the planet, wildlife and people, and affordable housing. Not to mention historical resources and recreation. Um, but we often don't have enough money to pay for open space and um, affordable housing and, and the other, you know, recreation and um, um, historical preservation, some, you know, to pay for these important projects. And I realize taxes are not fun, but raising it a tiny bit, even just a 2% 2 would make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Alyssa Nicole. Thank you. This is Alyssa Nickel, um, also on School Street, and I am an associate member of the Community Preservation Committee, but I am speaking tonight as a resident, um, not for the committee. Um, I also support increasing the CPA surcharge to 3%. Um, 
that's, you know, for the average household, $3 a week. Um, I can't even buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks for that. Um, the return on investment is, is significant. Um, we get a lot of value for our dollar. The projects um, that come for funding um, are required to have uh, funding leveraged from other sources. So not only um, are we getting leveraged funds um, from the state matching rounds, but we're also getting um, funds um, leveraged from the projects themselves. Um, I like the, the CPA funding surcharge because it allows the town, um, like what was mentioned earlier, the, the, the money stays locally. Um, it, it also allows us to fund projects that have limited alternative funding sources or no funding sources. Um, Um, it allows town residents and town meeting members to determine the projects that are most valuable um, to us, you know, as, as separate from the budget that pays for necessities like our schools, our town staff, police, um, fire, road infrastructure, snow plowing, that sort of thing. Um, I love the fact that there are exemptions for low income households. Um, so that it, it limits the, the tax burden on residents. Um, and I am going to um, counter um, what Mr. Aylesbury said about the increased vetting of, of projects. I think that the committee um, has always done a great job um, with vetting those projects. Um, and what's happened is when there's not enough funding, there are worthy projects that are, are not funded. Time's up, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Ray Yakubi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Ray. Um, actually, I have a question for the board. Have you reviewed the uh, a rather extensive report that was done for the board about four years ago on this very topic? Yes, and it's in the packet for anybody else who'd like to read it. Um, I have mixed feelings on this. I, I, I'm actually on the Community Preservation Committee. I've been chair. I want to echo what Mr. Aylesbury is saying. I'm not sure we're ready. Um, I can't think of a stronger proponent for CPA. I think it's one of the best pieces of public policy that we have. But if you, the, I want to counter a couple of things. A, it's not a panacea. Even if we went to 3%, it would not solve our open space issue that we're facing right now. The, the, that's going to have to be solved beyond CPC, given the amount of money we're talking about for parcels. So A, this would not solve that issue. B, if you look at the town manager's report, that he's, there has been a significant increase in funding. So it's not like we have, we were at well, 1.4, a few years ago we were at 900. So there's been in significant increased funding. One minute. I agree with Bill though. I think, you know, it has, what we've done, we're starting to do a better job of vetting projects. And quite candidly, I think on some of these things, we're gonna have to learn there's some things we simply can't afford. Um, but I, I, so I think when we, the committee is doing some work right now on trying to understand that, what are the communities are doing, and I think it'd be um, uh, ill-advised to move forward with this now because I think we'd have to do a lot of preparation for town meeting. Remember, this is going to take some time. We're going to have to go to town meeting or 5% of the voters are going to have to sign a petition and then it would have to go to an election. So we're a year to two away from actually implementing an increase anyway. So, uh, so I just want to caution the select board thinking that, oh, if we do this, our open space problem is solved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have our call-in user. Go ahead. Hi, this is Tara. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I just hope that people, if they're an employee or a, a board member, that they will say so. I believe that Tina is an employee of the town, and Ray was. Anyway, so um, that aside, I agree with Alyssa and the others about the value, um, but in terms of the affordability, I'd like to hear from two groups before I decide what I think about affordability, the Friends of the Senior Center and the New Apartment Dwellers Group. 
Um, I do have two questions before I go on with my comments. Um, this is a 51% town meeting vote and a 51% ballot vote, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. And uh, the dollar amount that would increase for the average home, what amount of money comes gets to be spent um, for that? So if it's 176 or whatever it is, how much actual cash gets uh, gets hand it back in historically so if we if we doubled the 1.5 to 3 percent we would have twice as much money plus somewhere between 40 and sixty thousand dollars i thought then there's an increase in match and another increase in match so i'm wondering what the total um increase in expenditure or budget allowed to be spent, the dollars allowed to be spent would increase by what if we dump the amount for the average homeowner? So it's roughly double. Uh, uh, John, please. Okay. All right, so it's a one for one. So then it hardly matters whether, anyway. Uh, I agree with Ray that it won't solve the land issue, um, but we don't have to per limit our land purchases to only CPA. With a high return on investment, we could engage in a major land purchase program and or enact a land bank so that 1% to 2% of all house sales per year, millions of dollars would be devoted to land, not just a small amount. Also, we don't have to rely only on purchases. We can enact land clearing limits and stop the planning board from handing out density bonuses. I am personally interested interested in increasing it to the full 3% unless people uh, at the senior uh, center and the, or the apartment dwellers object to this. But I'm not interested in fueling more new building that is yet unaffordable to people making less than $50,000 a year and could destroy trees, increase purpose surfaces, all heated by gas. I would support this only if the housing part was 100% dedicated to rehab of existing buildings to make them very affordable for people making $50,000 a year. Um, and I will again speak about the um, Housing Rehab Trust. I, I believe it's on the select, goal, select Board's goals, and I haven't seen any progress. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Jeff Burgard. Thank you, Jeff Burgard, Alcott Street, Acton. Um, I echo what some earlier speakers said about it's too soon. Um, number one, open space is very important, but CPA funds are not only uh, are not all available for open space. So by expanding the funding, you're now adding money to other pools, which um, it's previous town meetings you've seen, um, the town is not really interested in uh, paying for reshingling an art uh, uh, dealer or um, a condominium what uh, clock tower. In addition, um, I have to teach my kids about the difference between need and want. And I think that if we don't, you know, obviously people want money and that's what's happening. We have more requests than available funds. But I think the previous speakers have said we need a lot more requests so we can um, separate the really good ones from the ones that really not necessarily need in the town. There are a lot of people that have fixed incomes and this is going to be a, um, you know, the death of a thousand cuts. It may not be a lot of dollars, but with the new dual school and the fire station coming on board, I, for one, am going to ask my select board, um, what are you doing to freeze or cut back on other taxes and to expand another tax um, permanently, in essence, as opposed to having a vote at town meeting to spend X million for a specific parcel? Um, that's going to put undue hardship on the towns, the citizens of the town. I will tell you, I have a property in another state, and one of the ways they raise what's equivalent of CPA money is not through the tax rate, but rather every time a building is sold, there's a half percent, one percent tax from the town on Thank you, Jeff. those properties. Thank you. Time's up. Uh, next up is Walter Foster. Hi, I'm Walter Foster, 3 Jesse Drive. Uh, thank you for bringing this to the board's agenda. I, I'm fully in support of going to the 3%. Um, I've been on the CPC since its founding and as a board, uh, select board person at the time, helped bring this to the town. 
This is a proven track record of leveraging state funds that is both fair to the entire populace within Acton that has wonderful kind of progressive approach with uh, rebates and other stuff to those who can least afford it. But that has been leveraged to a degree where many of these projects have raised individual and other sources of fund in addition to the CPC funds. Um, I, I think the time is now. There's no time to waste about this, to get moving, to be able to build the war chest, not only for open space, but for all of the four, if you will, interest groups that are at the table. Um, time and time again at town meeting, it's been proven because all of them, affordable housing, recreational use, open space and historical preservation have all been supported in the really myriad of projects, including the rail trails and the like. So I would strongly urge the board to consider adopting the full 3%. Thank you. We have uh, Kara Lafferty. Hi there, Kara Lafferty, 33 Neshoba Road. Thank you, Walter, Tara, Alyssa, and Franny. I echo your comments. As a recent CPC applicant for a recreation project, I just kind of wanted to share my experience. Um, the projects we fund through CPC are those that improve our day-to-day -day life. Folks are leaving this town to enjoy amenities regularly in other towns nearby. The tax burden will likely quickly be recouped through the increase in home values. If we are needing to say no more often, to projects coming before the CPC. Perhaps we need to increase the diversity of person and thought on the committee. When I look around town, I see many unmet needs. I see them in affordable housing and recreation specifically. A vulnerable population, those with disabilities and seniors are not presently well served with housing. Waiting to increase this just kicks the can down the road further. So long as we have facilities incapable of welcoming, welcoming all members of our community, these funds are a need and not a want. I respectfully request that this board endorse the 3% surcharge to maximize state funding leverage. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So I think that's all the speakers uh, um, uh, participating remotely. Um, so w w what I would propose that we do is, first of all, that we um, actually take our vote on this next meeting, and that allows um, um, some committees to weigh in who, who can meet between now and, and next time. Um, and there, there are a few committees that have approached me and said that they, you know, like to have an opinion, but they, you know, didn't have a, a time uh, to meet last week. And besides, they wanted to hear people's input tonight. Um, so what I would like to do is to give each member a chance to, to, to speak, you know, to, if they would like uh, to express an opinion on this. And then we'll, we'll close down the discussion for tonight and come back in, in two weeks um, for, uh, for just a short discussion and vote. Um, so anybody would like to speak? Uh, Dean, please. Thank you. So. Um, First, I'll, I'll speak as in my position as chairman of the CPA. Um, you know, I do think it's important that the CPC be given a chance to weigh in on it. We heard a couple individual members uh, present their own personal feelings about this. I think within CPC, this is going to be a fairly lengthy discussion. Uh, we do meet tomorrow night, and then we won't meet for several weeks after that. So I'm not sure that we'll have enough time to, to produce a, uh, a vote. Uh, we're right in the midst of, of evaluating applications and trying to classify this stuff uh, so that we can present it um, and get it on the warrant. So that the timing is a little tricky, but um, I'll certainly do my best. Um, as far as my own personal feelings on this, I have really mixed feelings. I, I do think it's appropriate that this be placed on town meeting warrant and that people get a chance to, uh, to weigh in on it. As far as a recommendation, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm particularly, my feeling has always been, and I'm on record repeatedly along these lines, that the highest and best use of CPA funds is for open space preservation. And in fact, 
this is sort of what brought this whole discussion about is that we've got open space projects out there and we know we don't have enough money for it. So I think if we are going to look at increasing this, because in my opinion, the clear and present need at this point is to put more money in open space. I think in addition to consideration of what percentage to go to, I think there has to be an earmark. Um, in the past, open space has asked for about 30% of what's available in the kitty. And in the last couple of years, we've not been able to give that. It's usually been more like 25%. I think that there should be an earmark of at least 40% to go into open space automatically. Open space is a rapidly dwindling resource. In another 10 or 15 years, it won't exist anymore in this town. So it's very important that we prioritize that above everything else. My second thought is, I'll agree with Bill Ellsbury, having more projects than we have money is not necessarily a bad thing. If there's a basket of money out there, there's gonna be an infinite number of people who wanna reach their hand into that basket. And I think certainly with my six or seven years experience on CPA, I've seen a lot of applications that I would consider to be ill-conceived. And certainly there are a number that I saw that were ill-conceived and that were voted anyway uh, at town meeting prior to my getting on community preservation committee. One of which led to a huge lawsuit which the town lost. So I think it's important that we make sure the CPC is, has their feet held to the fire and that some real rigor be used for reviewing these projects. So I don't think, um, if we have a huge sum of money, there's just gonna be a huge number of people who are gonna dream up projects, some of which are virtuous and some of which are not. So I would not automatically go to increasing the amount. If we're going to, as a board, vote to uh, to support the idea of increasing an amount, I would only vote for it if we connect that with a uh, requirement that at least 40% be dedicated solely to open space. Thank you. Other members? Sure. Jim. Okay, Himager, you go please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually have a few questions. I don't know if I should ask them now or when we revisit this. Well, you might as well ask them now because maybe people at home also have similar questions and better to know, I think. Great, thanks. Um, my first one is, um, is uh, what other towns um, in our surrounding area, do they also have a 3% charge? Like, what are their rates in comparison to ours? John, do you know the answer to that? In terms of which communities are at 1.5 and which ones are at 3? Yeah, they're at 2, 2.5. Yeah. Um, do we know kind of at least in the surrounding towns what their rates are? Yeah, it was mentioned earlier. Uh, there, I, I can find a list of exactly who's, who's what or who's in what. Uh, category. Maybe, uh, Himaj, you can go forward with your next question or comment while he's looking that up. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, the second one was I was reading through the um, study committee report and um, there was um, one note um, about um, the exemption for the first 100000 on taxable value um, of commercial properties. I think I read that right. Um, I was wondering if someone could elaborate because I'm not familiar with that. So, so I, I believe that the, the way that it works, the surtax is applied on the value of your house minus $100,000. So if you, have a, if you have the average house, which is, I, don't, I forget exactly, $650,000, the surcharge is applied on $550,000. Got you. Thank you. Um, and then um, just a clarification question. If we did change um, the surcharge um, to say hypothetically 3%, would it require another town vote in the future if we wanted to decrease that amount or, or change it in any way? Y yes, it's, uh, it, it, um, we, when we looked it up, it requires a, a ballot vote to change it and, and this requires um, town meeting putting it on the ballot. So 
um, the select board can't put it on the ballot. Thank you. Um, and then my last question is, um, is three percent the max we can go? That's just a clarification. I think that's what I heard. I think that is correct. And just checking with um, the town manager if you found that number. Uh, yes, there are, there are 183 communities, so I can try to find ones that are close by. Um, Ayer is 3%. Ashland is 3%. Bedford is 3%. Belmont is 1.5%. Uh, Billerica is 1%. Boston is 1%. Boxborough is 1%. Uh, Carlisle is 2 Chelmsford is 1.5%. Concord is 1.5%. Dunstable is 3 Drake is 2 uh, Let's see here. Ocean is three, not nearby, but just so you know. Um, Groton is three. Harvard is 1.1. 1 .1. Um, Hudson is one. Lenox. Lexington is three. Lincoln is three. Littleton is one. Marshall. Maynard is one and a half. We're halfway through the alphabet. You want me to keep going? I think that's good. You have a that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, that was really helpful. Thank you. So I'll, I'll offer my opinion. Um, I'm very much 5149 on this, and I think it could really go either way personally. Um, I agree with Dean. I think that it should be something we try to put on the ballot just to see what the majority um, of our residents think. Um, but I do... I think one of my biggest reservations is kind of the difference between theory and practice. So hypothetically, we increase to say 3%. We do have some people that can be exempt for it based on their income. But in reality, how many people are gonna know enough about town government to know that this is something that they can get reduced? How many people are actually gonna go through the process of doing that? Um, you know, even if they do need it financially, um, and even if this does pose a burden to them. Um, and I think for that reason, I am hesitant. Um, I, I do see the need for increasing CPA funds. For me, I think 2% is something I feel a little bit more comfortable with, especially because if we do propose, say, going to 3%, I, I really don't see any time in the future or near future where that would be reduced. I think once we have it at 3%, that's something that isn't going to change for our town or at least go down in, in any way. So that's where my reservation is. Um, but I do see the need. I do see the need for increasing it. And so that's where I'm really not being helpful because I'm 5149. And I think, like you said, David, hearing what other committees think. Um, at least for me, would be really helpful. So that's where I'll leave it. Great, thank you. Uh, either uh, Fran or Jim. Fr uh, Jim. Um, well, first of all, I want to acknowledge that um, although most of the people that were speaking tonight were in favor of increasing the percentage, if we look at the mail we got as a select board, it was not that. Uh, it was more people who were concerned about raising it. Um, and I think we're going to see a similar change from uh, a town meeting vote to a ballot box vote. Um, and so I think this is only worth traveling down this path if we have people that are willing, and I'm one of them, uh, to do the education uh, that's going to be helpful to help, you know, get, get the vote out and explain what's going on. And in particular, I think that education should um, highlight um, the CPA exemption uh, exemptions. You know, we we don't we create uh, tax abatement strategies not because we're trying to be nice, but because it's a matter of policy. 
The town has a goal of keeping people in town, you know, after their kids leave school or after they retire. It's better financially and socially for the town to keep people there. So I'm very sensitive to the, to the idea that we would be, you know, raising taxes if we don't need to, because um, I know that that hurts people. And to me, the fact that, you know, if you're under 60 and you're a single person, the limits, uh, your income limit is $67,000 and you can get, you can pay no CPA. If you're, a, if you're a family of more than two, of two or more people, it's 77000 If you're over 60, which is where a lot of the pain of the CPA is felt, because these are people typically that have houses, but maybe not a lot of income. Single person can get ex total exemption if they have an income of 84000 or less. And if they're a family of two or more, it's $96,000 a year. Then they can pay no CPA. Um, this, to me, makes, makes me a lot more comfortable with the notion of raising this. If we also do a good job of communicating that we have these exemptions here for a reason uh, and that we would encourage people to use them. The other thing I, I, I want to support, what, the people who were most enthusiastic uh, about the increasing the CPA were the folks who had, who understood the coming open space projects. And I agree that that has the best, um, it has the greatest and clearest value for the town to keep those parcels from being developed. So it is perfectly within the law for us to increase the minimums. I mean, right now we have 10% minimum in housing, 10% minimum in um, open space, and 10% minimum in um, historic preservation. There's no minimum for recreation. Um, but those three right now, by our, by our, by our uh, law, are at 10% each. I'd be totally comfortable with raising that open space minimum to 40%. Um, to me, those are the... Uh, those are the those are the things that if we can't afford them now and they slip out of our hands, we don't get a second chance. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you, Fran. Did you have something? Probably not uh, anything different from what everyone else is saying. Um, I would be in support of an increase. Um, to the 3%. Um, uh, the idea is lost on me of having not enough money to fund a pro like too many projects. I, I would love to see if you, I love historic preservation. I, I would love to see there be enough money for projects um, and not have to struggle year over year with having something go to the back of the line. Um, and I'd love to hear from other committees, but, but I would be all for um, raising it to the 3%. Thank you. Um, so when, I, when, I, when, we, when the town first approved the CPA funding, um, I was very skeptical, frankly. I, th I was skeptical of this other pot of money that, um, uh, you know, Get out, got allocated and spent separately. But I have to say, in the years since, I've been super pleased. I mean, the, it is really rare that um, I think that we have a, and I can't even think of one, that there's a project in, at, uh, that we approve a town meeting for an expenditure of, uh, of CPA funds that I think is a bad project. And I want to say, the way things are now, for certain uh, projects, the, the amount of CPA uh, funds that we have um, limits how we can use it. And it even, you know, is, is a trying decision for the members of the CPC. Um, so when you have a project that costs, like Gardner Field uh, Playground, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if they approve, you know, some, some CPC members prefer a one and done approach, meaning that th there should be an application with a known endpoint for a project, and there's a there's a request, and then there's an allocation or not, um, and um, but for the larger projects, that really is not possible given uh, the size of the project without eclipsing a whole bunch of smaller projects. So you take one big project, and you might give away really as many as ten little projects uh, um, that 
to, to get that one big one. And phasing the, pro, um, the projects is also problematic, right? You know, uh, you know, some people want to know what the endpoint's going to be, but that's really difficult to do when you're, you're, you're phasing the, um, uh, the implementation of the project across multiple CPA cycles. It, it's just d difficult. Um, a number of people have expressed um, uh, open space, and I'm certainly supportive of open space, there the problem is big in a different way. Certainly anything we spend open space on greatly exceeds um, the, um, the annual budget for, um, uh, for CPC. But we do it in one of two ways. We either bond them and pay them back over time from CPC funds, or we set aside funds to start with, and then there's a pot of, say, a million dollars or something which can be used as part of a deal to buy... Uh, by open space, um, um, and maybe we need set aside for for other things as 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 well. Um, so I, I think there's a, a need here for a, a bit more money to support the the bigger kind of projects, um, you know. And I but I understand that the, the the people may be concerned about the cost. So I, I'm actually wondering if um, uh, an amount in between one and a half percent and three percent is appropriate, you know, either two percent or two and a half percent. Um, so, um, I mean, I don't know, I have to think about this a little bit more before uh, our next, next meeting, but, you know, it, it may be w worthwhile to do something, something in between. Any other comments before we move on to our next agenda item? Okay. Um, the, the budget, just so, just so people know, the town manager is going to present a revised um, 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 uh, budget. We had, um, uh, so I just want to note two things. Um, one is we have uh, an, an ALG process where um, the town agreed to make um, um, some cuts to uh, uh, fit within the finance committee's requests and the ALG agreement. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing is um, the select board is required to transmit the, the budget officially to um, the finance committee um, two months before town meeting. And so we need to vote on that, uh, that tonight. And so um, I'll hand it over now to the uh, town manager to present his revised budget. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just... Uh trying to share the, the correct thing here. Okay, looks like we're good. So uh, the budget was presented first um, on December 6th, and this is just a quick recap. Uh, this information has been uploaded to the packet. It's also online at actonma.gov slash manager uh, to anyone that's interested in reviewing the full details. Uh, but this budget um, information, I went over highlights uh, over last year. Uh, always in budgeting, we, uh, we focus on the select board's goals, and this year there were short-term goals uh, that there, there were 11, and there were six long-term goals that we tried to uh, target as we developed this budget. Uh, th we just recapped that the funding received from the federal government was used to uh, support the school districts and our COVID response and some community-based programs like mortgage and rental assistance. Uh, the board had a comprehensive process to develop an ARPA investment plan uh, that was approved in October. It was revised uh, slightly in January, and uh, it will be revisited again, um, I, I expect, this year by the board. Uh, in all, uh, we received $7 million, allocated 3.7 in 22, allocated $1.4 million in 23, and the one9 uh was held in reserve, in some cases earmarked, in other cases just general reserve. And that's something that the select board uh, committed to review on an annual basis to realign uh, as, as necessary. Uh, a lot of work in the budget is related to infrastructure, and uh, we're, we're continuing to follow the federal uh, funding that we're hoping will become available through various means. Uh, we still haven't received the details on that yet, but we're, we're hopeful. And all the investments that we're making locally are to help position us to uh, try to access that funding and to advance many of the initiatives that we have already uh, started. Uh, a lot of the discussion 
that's taken place uh, at the ALG table, uh, which led us to uh, this revised budget is related to maintaining an adequate level of reserves. Over the last few years, we've worked very hard to uh, stabilize our reserves. As, as you could see, there was a downward trend uh, for, for, several re for several reasons, but uh, we've been able to stabilize that and, and bring it uh, back to a, a level that we're more comfortable with. And the budget that we've proposed is to uh, maintain a floor uh, in, of reserves in an amount that uh, is recommended by the Finance Committee and uh, we feel comfortable uh, puts us in a position to uh, have an adequate reserve balance. Uh, the challenges that we face this year, health insurance rates increased 10%. This, in, this impacts our employees and our, us as the employer who pays a large, report, a large portion of the plans. Our pension assessment increased as it has last few years, uh, much more than 2.5%, uh, this year at 6.6%. Our collective bargaining agreements are still in the process of being negotiated and as such we have four unsettled contracts. We have a large capital investment need. Uh, there are staffing needs and this uh, pandemic response and recovery has been, was a big part of the budget development process. We uh, highlighted, I, I highlighted that day on the budget presentation several of the priorities within the budget. These, these priorities are not going to be impacted by the change that I'm presenting tonight, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. Uh, let's see here. So to get to the changes, so the, the select board uh, at the meeting last week, we discussed that to get to a 3% overall total budget, we would need to make some revisions. And uh, I felt strongly that these revisions should come in the capital plan, uh, even though we've worked very hard to develop a 10-year plan. Um, the changes changing to the operating budget would have long, you know, uh, effects that uh, would, would be harder to recover from than changes in the capital plan. Uh, capital. So uh, what we're recommending is uh, reducing the the capital plan and the free cash uh, appropriations by 133,000. Uh, the total requests uh, now will be 304,000 from free cash. Uh, the general fund borrowing projects will remain as proposed earlier. Uh, there are four borrowing projects, River Street Dam, complete streets and intersections, the sidewalk program, and bridge and construction and design. Uh, those four projects represent spending of 2.3 million with an estimated debt service cost uh, next year of 366,000. Uh, it's important that um, I call attention to DPW 16, which is a sidewalk program. This is uh, reflective of the strong uh, su support that we believe there is in the community for sidewalk construction. And there's a lot of people that have requested that we make a major investment. And so DPW put in a request for $5 million. And um, with the way that we approached this was that instead of spending $5 million this year, why don't we make a substantial investment in making some design, uh, advancing designs to make a bunch of construction ready uh, sidewalk segments and then come back in a future year with a large borrowing request for the board to, and the town to consider uh, once we have more definitive costs on what those sidewalk segments will exactly cost because sidewalk construction goes up every year and it's a lot more expensive than people think it is. So um, the reductions to the FY23 capital plan in the free cash area. Um, I tried to illustrate how, how it went from the departmental requests in the second column called initial requests to what was presented at the, during the capital plan presentation on November 15th. Uh, we made changes in preparing the overall town manager's recommended budget on December 6th to make sure that we delivered a budget that was in the low threes. And as such, we had to make some reductions at that point. Uh, and tonight, we're making further reductions uh, to bring the budget overall a, a cost to 3%. So just to highlight what those uh, most recent changes are, the first one is in D DPW 10, uh, reducing the net zero vehicle fleet replacement program. Um, and we'll be able to um, delay or or um, the way that the, the car industry is working out is that 
the car orders have been on delay anyway, so I think we would be fine to, to spend uh, less this year because it's been harder to get these vehicles. So we, we think we can do okay by reducing that amount in DPW 10 and not um, severely impact our 10-year plan to turn over the whole fleet. Um, DPW 4, FA, uh, facility 43 and 44, those are projects. Uh, one of them is to install a tight tank at a, the fire station three, and the other one is to do fire alarm systems in fire stations one and three. Those projects will still move forward, but we will phase them. We will, we will do the design work. Uh, we will do half of the fire alarms, and, um, and we'll be able to do that to advance the effort uh, and not lose a full year um, from this cut. Uh, p planning 08, that's the zoning bylaw recodification. This is something that was in the capital plan. Um, it's a project that's gonna take time. Um, we wouldn't probably be able to finish it next year. Um, and so we're gonna take a, a, a more um, deliberate and incremental approach to it and try to get started on it in smaller bits and pieces um, this year and next year and come back and, and see how much more we actually need to ask for out of a capital request. Um, ideally, we would have the money set aside and then just be able to work from that. But given the budget constraints, uh, we're comfortable taking a different approach uh, in this particular project. Um, the only other cut um, that isn't highlighted here, but I wanted to mention uh, from the borrowing program is the electric buses for replacing the cat buses. That was initially proposed as a borrowing project. It, it was cut um, uh, to December 6th um, version of this presentation. A large, re uh, we, we applied for a grant for that and uh, we're hopeful that it works out. If not, we're gonna continue to do that and, and hope that we can find an alternative way to fund that. Uh, if not, bring it back next year for consideration. So, so that is the, the change. Um, so if you look at the municipal operations remains as it was presented December 6, subsidies remains as it was presented on December 6, and then capital um, is reduced by 133,000. So the total budget request is 38,942698, which is uh, 1.1 million more than uh, the budget overall was in FY22, and that is a 3% increase uh, year over year. And so the, the, I'd ask tonight that the board uh, consider formally adopting this budget or, or, or recommending this budget and uh, taking the procedural step of transmitting it to the Finance Committee, uh, where that body will then um, consider it and make its recommendation to town meeting. And uh, both the Select Board's recommendation and the Finance Committee's recommendation will be written into the warrant, and hopefully it will be the same uh, recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Man Manager. Just for clarification, two votes, one to adopt and one to transmit? Or is that just one vote? Yeah, one, one vote would do. Okay. So um, I'll allow um, members to comment here, and then I'll take uh, comments from the, the public, and then we'll vote. So, um, and, yeah, I was going to ask if you could stop sharing so I could see the other members. Thank you. Um, so any members like to make a comment on this? Just yeah. a quick one. Um, thank you. Um, I, I don't think I would have recommended anything different if I had had that difficult task. Um, so I appreciate your, you and your staff going through this and coming up with a sensible plan. Uh, uh, Dean? Yeah, I'll, I'll second what uh, Jim has said. Uh, it's a tough job. I've been on both sides of this for a number of times. Um, and I think those are some good decisions that the town manager has made and is recommending, uh, you know, one in particular kind of struck a chord with me, those uh, fire alarm systems uh, for the fire stations. Uh, I think that was something that I first surfaced probably 25 years ago. So uh, sooner or later, we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Himager or Fran? Himager? Thanks. Uh, just I want to echo what everyone has said. Um, it's no easy task. Um, I appreciate that, um, you know, even though we are making some cuts in our capital um, plans that, you know, there's still ongoing efforts um, and we're just reframing how we approach them. Um, so 
it seems that there's nothing that's really ta being taken out of priority, just that we're, we're reallocating our funds, we're reassessing kind of where those should go. Um, so I appreciated that. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to add. I think it was um, a job well done and thank you. Thank you. Um, Fran, do you have anything? I just wanted to thank John and for all his hard work and, um, and echo what Himaja just said. And this is exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, I also would like to thank the town manager. I'm aware of the agonizing that went on to, to cut the capital budget. It's, you know, down uh, almost 18% from last year. Um, so it's uh, in, in order to keep the, the, the overall rate of, of uh, spending increase just at 3%. So, um, you know, a very uh, good job. Um, I'm, uh, you know, been pretty satisfied with uh, uh, the the budget process. I think it's you know nothing is is perfect. You know, uh, I'm sure everybody would like to have seen it done uh, a little little differently. But I think the, the 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 outcome has been pretty good. It's been you know uh, amicable. Everybody's made sacrifices and and things like that. So it's 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 gone uh, it's gone well. Um, I'll not take uh, comments from the public. Um, uh, there's one speaker in uh, the room here. Yes, we have uh, Franny Osman. Well, hold off just a second. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Justin, sorry about that. I'm going to take the speaker in the room first, and then I'll take the online speakers. Please go ahead. Charlie Cadillac, Boring Road. I'm just curious, what was the inflation rate that was built into this revised budget? Uh, we look at the departmental expenses and understand what what they'll be and, and make adjustments in, in, in each category in, in different cases for different um, supplies and services and personnel. So there wasn't one specific rate that we just applied to the whole budget. Can you give me an idea of some of the typical ones? Uh, well... Um, Sure. Um, the cost of advertising uh, for positions and for legal ads goes up every few years, so we increased uh, the amount that we're budgeting for that to reflect that uh, okay. incremental increase. Well, it doesn't really matter because it is a bottom line budget, so you're going to spend the money any way you need to, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I think by the time fiscal 23 starts, we're going to be looking at considerably different costs for some of the things that you have to buy, such as electricity, fuel, you know, paper clips, whatever. Uh, so I, I don't think this budget is, represents what's actually going to happen next year for the simple reason that uh, the world has changed. I won't elaborate. I think you all know what I'm talking about. So, you know, it's, it's okay to have a budget, but let's, let's keep in mind that it's not likely to be realistic and uh, not make commitments early in the fiscal year, which will make it impossible to provide the services that are otherwise needed. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great um, observation. And I think if you observe the last two budget cycles, uh, I think there was much uh, unknown and variables that we were trying to understand. And, and we have a very professional uh, operation here. The department has the finance team uh, closely monitor the situations and, and as needed we, we adjust and, and make uh, necessary adjustments. I mean if you look at 2020 uh, it was actually two years ago this week that the entire uh, operation that we run here went to a screeching halt. In some cases I mean public safety and everyone still provides services but the way we did it totally changed and we, we took a lot of uh, measures to make sure that Financially, we were going to be able to get through whatever happened because we didn't really know what was going to happen. And even as we planned for the following year's budget, we had the same sort of uncertainty in the background. But we, we know that 
uh, we have enough uh, people that are closely watching this that we'll, we'll make adjustments as we go. We can't predict the future. I hope that uh, we're not in situations that, that you're um, suggesting next year, but if they are, we'll take the necessary uh, measures to do what we need to do uh, for the community. In no way is my, are my comments a criticism of anybody, but I just think it's worth highlighting what we are up against. Thank you. Uh, and now, J Justin, if you could call on the remote participants, please. I think I'm unmuted. Franny's unmuted. Go ahead. Hi. Um, this is Franny Osman. Again, I just wanted to thank um, John Mangerati for focusing in on the sidewalk need. Um, I believe you found that it would be like $18 million ultimately to, to do all of the priority sidewalks that we have right now on the list. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and I just, I just think going, accelerating the direction toward there instead of creeping along as we have been is so good. So I really thank you for that and for keeping an eye on the EV buses um, because that will make such a difference. Um, so I just wanted to appreciate that a lot of people are really anxious for sidewalks that are on those priority lists and even a few more that aren't but have developed needs. Thank Thanks you very much. I'm excited about taking that big step. Uh, next up, we have Ray Yacoubi. Uh, it's Ray Yacoubi, 25 Harris Street. Uh, just to, I'm not sure this is the right place, but I didn't want to acknowledge, um, I think, the very professional job that John and his staff has done on managing a very complex um, and difficult budget. So I, I, I appreciate the professionalism and the work that's gone into it. As an aside, I did want to take this opportunity. It was on one of his slides about infrastructure improvements, and he mentioned the sidewalk on Harris Street. Um, I live on Harris Street. I cannot begin to tell you what an incredible difference that sidewalk has made. Harris Street is now walkable. It's safe. It's an improvement to the town. I think the job that John did with that made sure that that was a priority as part of the firehouse, he should be commended for. It's a, it's, I can walk my dog now and not worry about if I'm going to get run over. And when we were going through the hearings on the, on the fire state, everybody was concerned about how dangerous Harris Street is. The answer is they were correct. It's not dangerous now. For pedestrians. So I really wanted to make comment that that was a significant, um, for those of you who don't know, you can walk from 2A all the way to 27 on Harris Street. And if you want to, you can walk to Nero Park now without being worried about getting run over by a car. So I think he should be acknowledged because I know he made that a priority as part of the project. I think it should be uh, acknowledged. And I, as a resident, I wanted to thank him very much. Very much makes the town more walkable in a very significant way. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, Colin User. <laughs> Colin User. You you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Oh, yes, thank you so much. Um, so, of course, I'll, uh, you know, even though this is not in the budget right now, I will put a plug in for the uh, an apartment dweller um, advocate. Uh, but also about land. I feel like um, the town kind of feeding on the growth of town and using the money from growth to fund expenses. Um, is not a good practice and that it should go to um, something like land purchase that would be an investment in, in the town um, to avoid future costs. So um, I think, feel like it's time that we enact some kind of land bank or at least put in the budget line item 1%, 2% every year to pay for land purchase. 
because it pays us back and uh, green spaces are right. And people are getting crowded and crowded, and you're talking about 15 units per acre and crowding out even the most vulnerable people for the little teeny bit of green space they have left. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all the um, remote participants. Um, so um, I would take a motion to uh, adopt the town manager's uh, revised recommended budget and transmit it to the finance committee. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, any final discussion? Seeing none, Jim, would you call the roll, please? Um, on approving this change to the budget and transmitting it to the Finance Committee, uh, Himogen Nagaretti. Aye. Fran Arsenault. Aye. Dean Charter. Aye. David Martin. Aye. And Jim Snyder Grant says aye. We're unanimous. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you uh, to the team at Town Hall and, and across the departments to make this work. It was a team effort. Uh, item seven, uh, discuss the uh, Department of Energy Resources stretch code. Uh, Jim, you asked to have this put on the agenda. We want to take it up you know start us off sure um, this is an opportunity either for the board as a whole or for individual board members to sign on to a letter um, here's some background um, so the Commonwealth Energy Code which is part of the building code comes in two varieties there's the regular energy code and the so-called stretch energy code um, any town that becomes a green community as Acton is has signed on to the stretch energy code um, but then the Climate Roadmap Bill, which got signed earlier in 2021, requires the DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, to develop uh, a further level of opt-in stretch code, a net zero stretch code. Um, the straw proposal for this new code was recently released, and the DOER is in the middle of gathering comments before promulgating a final version. Um, so when town meeting passed this building with clean energy bylaw quite overwhelmingly in 2021, the bylaw included an acknowledgement that we couldn't proceed to slow down the use of fossil fuel infrastructure and new construction and major rehab without state legislative action. Um, this new opt-in uh, net zero stretch code promises promised, I would say, to be a way to achieve the goals by providing a path for Acton to opt in to this new net zero stretch code. Um, but instead, uh, the draft regulations allow for the use of natural gas or other fossil fuels and actually prohibit towns from taking on an extra level of, of energy code that would, that would prevent uh, the use of fossil fuels in, in, new, in new construction. So it's, it does not accomplish what Acton wants to get accomplished. Um, the, the draft regulation allows for the use of natural gas or other fossil fuels as long as you do a couple of other things. You know, slightly tighter houses, better, better electrical systems for some future electrification. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not what we need in order to get done what we need to get done. Um, so the attached letter is a request to make the opt-in stretch code a true net zero stretch code. Um, We've got, the uh, last time I looked, we've got representatives from 37 towns, um, uh, elected officials, um, um, nonprofit organizations, um, and uh, developers and builders. Um, the, I'd love to add the select board uh, to this letter, and I would love to, uh, or add as many people on the select board as want to sign up. Other comments? I, I can I can add a, a comment here. So I, I actually attended the um, the stretch code um, uh, release meetings that the state held. Um, uh, actually, overall, the the stretch code is is a very well considered code. I mean, they, they thought through a whole bunch of things, and I mean, I I don't even mind so much the um, the there's some versions of net zero that you can get to while still burning some fossil fuels. But what really gets me is this added um, hurdle of, and I didn't even realize it in the beginning, and I was, they didn't present this actually in the presentation, that it adds a, a, a further hurdle to towns going further to reduce the use of fossil fuel, 
right? It, it, it doesn't allow, allow us to proceed further. So even if, I mean, I don't know what, if we got a home rule petition, whether it would override this or not, you know, I guess it depends on the wording of the, the home rule uh, petition. But the, the fact that this prevents all towns, you know, towns that haven't done a home rule petition from, um, you know, uh, adopting an advanced code, if that's what they would like to do, I think is, that's terrible. Uh, you know, it, it's just re re really you know, bad. People should be able to have a choice here um, uh, as to how, how they want to push things along. And they're, and they're, uh, and they're n not, and in fact, the, the state is being slow here, right? There are things that they've uh, um, been very slow to adopt that have no cost impact. They reduced uh, the impact of, or, or, or the uh, propensity for climate change without, you know, costing anything. And th those things have not been, been moved forward. And, and the base thing here to me is that we, we at this point, should not be expanding the use of fossil fuels. That is the key thing, right? I understand that it's re really expensive uh, to retrofit, you know, um, uh, fossil fuel heated buildings, and that's that's something that we have to think through. But at this point, we shouldn't be adding to the problem. And and I, I was really disappointed when I got the note from Senator Barrett that said uh, that was the impact of this law because that was not presented that way by the, the, the people in the DOR, the, the DOE. Any, any other comments? Dean, please. Yeah, I'll agree with one thing you said, Dave, about people should have a right to choose. Um, and I think that should be made primarily on an individual level rather than some decision that's made uh, with a vote at town meeting at 11 o'clock at night amongst uh, less than 10% of the voters of town. Um, I think it's especially with what's been going on in the world, I think we need to maintain as much flexibility for all of our energy sources as possible and not invest everything in electrification. I think that uh, continued use of fossil fuel is probably something we're gonna be stuck with for better or for worse for a number of years. And uh, I would not be in favor of, of adopting a new stretch code that would totally eliminate it so I would, I would not be in favor of signing on to this letter. Uh, I take note of the fact that uh, some months ago there was this massive wildfire out near Boulder, Colorado. It took out about 1,000 households. And apparently the towns out there are able to adopt their own building codes. And the cost of upgrading to the newer stretch code in some of those towns was just huge, um, adding $75,000 to the house of re to the cost of replacement house. Some of these towns actually waived those codes on a temporary basis because of the huge financial impacts. So I think from the point of view of financial impacts, I think it's important that flexibility in fuel sources be maintained, and I would not be in favor of signing uh, the letter that you suggest. Other comments? Uh, Himachu. Thank you. Um, I am very much in favor of supporting this. Um, I think that, you know, it, it was actually something I wasn't um, much aware of until um, preparing for this meeting. Um, and to me, it seems pretty much like a no brainer. Um, I think that we've taken huge steps. Um, and, and, you know, I think that this would be a way for us to kind of continue to adhere to things that we've outlined, for example, in our climate action plan, things that we've been taking active efforts on. So Jim, I really, um, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up. Um, I am very much in favor of supporting this. I think a true net zero opt-in code is perfect um, and really cements our commitment even further, things that we've already um, committed to doing, I think that it, it is very much in line with what we need to do um, in order to not only support our future, but, you know, really take part in supporting the future of our state. Um, so very much in favor of it. And, and to my, um, and kind of based on what I've heard today, based on what I've read, I think that this actually 
um, would help to um, increase commitments across communities for um, making a bigger commitment to more renewable energy, curbing emissions, um, and in many ways opens up, you know, thinking about it, the possibilities of different energies. So, you know, almost providing a counterpoint, I think that, you know, this would actually provide more utility for individual municipalities to actually decide on what they want their renewable future to look like. So I think it actually provides a little bit more autonomy if you think about it that way. Um, Fran, do you have a comment? No, okay. So um, how do people want to proceed here? We could take a vote on um, allowing me to sign the letter on behalf of the board. We could instead um, n uh, not take any vote um, and just all sign it who wanted to sign it. Um, how do we want to proceed? Well, in this particular case, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with um, you know, um, signing people up who want to be signed up and not signing up everybody that doesn't want to be signed up. So I don't, I don't feel like there's a big gain here to have, you know, to sort of force, force Dean into a, you know, just in, 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 that his name would be associated with something that he's not comfortable with. Okay. So we don't actually need a vote for that, but I will take the, um, the there are a couple of people with their hands raised uh, online. I'll take those uh, comments, even though we're not technically making a decision. <laughs> So Justin, if you could call on them, please. Okay, we have uh, Richard Kelleher. Hello, thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to speak, I'll be brief. Um, I wanted to speak very strongly in favor of this. Uh, I'm an architect and the architectural community feels that the Baker administration's pretense to present a new stretch code is nothing but a Trojan horse. It's going backwards, if anything. We've been, I've been designing buildings to the uh, current stretch code, which, I mean, my clients are all going beyond it. I mean, it's not moving anybody in any direction. It's, it's irrelevant. And the other thing is, uh, going electric, I'm, I'm, I'm electrifying our church. It's a huge project. I'm, and I just put in four or five years ago a gas heating system in my house and it's the biggest regret I have in my life right now because I'm thinking of replacing it already with, uh, with heat pumps. Uh, heat pumps are, I mean, developers find them to be maybe even less expensive than fossil fuel. So why, why are we having any angst about that? So I, I guess I don't have an opinion about that, uh, about it other than that. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Colin User. Hi, this is Tara. Thank you for letting me speak, even though you weren't making a decision. I thought you were, so I wrote in and asked. Um, but when has ever when has Acton ever wanted to go beyond the existing stretch code? Because I'm sympathetic to what David says. I don't like the municipality to be limited. Um, but Akin has never been very bold. It barely wants to go along with the language enabling tiny improvements. Um, if we aren't wanting to expand the use of fossil fuels, then why do we keep letting people destroy all forests to um, effectively an acre a week to put in more impervious services that are burning fossil fuels? Uh, why not put together a major land purchase program, a land bank, or an act of building more autonomy as soon as possible? Land bank would give us time to find the money for the land purchases. The land bank would provide millions of dollars a year. Building moratorium would give us the time. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, so that's all the comments online. I just wanted to check with uh, you, Mr. Cadillac. You, you said in the beginning you wanted to speak on this item. Is that right? Yeah, I'll say it until I know that Everybody that's convinced otherwise will think that I shouldn't say it. I wonder how many of you who are convinced that fossil fuels are an element that's going to cause unusual warming of the earth and all this have actually looked at the source of the data such as it is 
that makes this claim. I wonder how many people understand where this comes from, because I have, and from an engineering point of view, the data is totally useless. And it would take me about two hours to explain it, so I won't start. But ask yourself, how much do you know about the claim that has established itself worldwide that fossil fuels are a problem? They're not. And eventually we'll all find out. But in the meantime, we go through this, except in Europe, which is beginning to change its mind. Uh, read the news. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, okay. okay. Um, so we've decided just to, uh, uh, select board members can individually um, sign this. Um, uh, m maybe, uh, uh, Lisa, you could after tell us all how we would do that or how to inform you about this letter or... I, I can send out a link to every fresh link to everyone. It's just a link you click. But are we going to get one one letter that we, we will actually send? Uh, no, it's a it's a it's the letter is already in your packet. This would just be signing on to this existing oh, so letter. Just sign on online. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, we'll move on to consent items then, and I'll read them. Um, please say, well, if you want one held. Um, uh, item eight, uh, request the use for town roads, Boston Brain Tumor Ride, May 15th, 2022. Number nine, committee appointment, Dina uh, A. Ferrara, Board of Registrars of Voters, term to expire, 2025. Uh, 10, one day alcoholic beverage license, Douglas Elementary, PTO, Elm Street Field, June 1st, 2022. 11, one day alcoholic beverage license, AB Youth Hockey, 50 Audubon Drive, March 18th, 2022. Uh, 12, approve extension of reduced parking rates uh, of $25 per month for all reserve spots through June 30th, 2022. I'd like to hold that one. And um, 13, refund request planning division totaling $4,339.78 for Mr. Robert Johnson's for costs associated with a withdrawal of a proposed definitive sub subdivision and special permit application without prejudice. So I would, um, oh, first I'd like to say that when I first read this, the fact that it, we are asking for alcoholic beverage licenses for Douglas Elementary <laughs> and AB Youth Hockey <laughs> caught my eye, but uh, those are for the adults involved in those things. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, I will take a, uh, uh, a motion to approve consent items 8 through 11 inclusive and 13. So moved. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Jim, would you call the roll, please? Absolutely. Um, on 8, th 8 through 11 and 13, um, Himogen Nagaretti. We didn't hear you, Himogen. Sadly, we did not hear you. Want to give us a thumbs up? Sorry, my internet cut out at the perfect time. I. Okay. <laughs> Fran Arsenal. Aye. Dean Charter. Aye. David Martin. Aye. Jim Snyder Grant says aye as well. Those are all approved. So for for item twelve, um, I just thought we might want to make it uh, September thirtieth of this year rather than June, <laughs> so we don't have to do this again in a couple of months. The the parking is not going to increase over the summer. Um, um, uh, also, the uh, the MBTA has has said, you know, in some analysis they did um, after uh, uh, in, in, sorry when the pandemic seemed to be ending in the end of 2021 that they expected um, most of the ridership to recover two years after the end of mm -hmm. the pandemic. So um, they um, that's not going to be recovered anyway. I, I would just propose that we. Do it uh, extend uh, the $25 per month rate um, uh, through uh, September 30th, 2022. I'll make that a motion, or I'll second it. Uh, you, you can make it. And is there a second? Oh, I'm, I'm in the habit of seconding tonight. I will second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion by anyone? Okay, um, uh, Jim, would you call the roll, please? 
Yes, on extending the reduced parking rates to September 30th. Uh, Himogen Nagaretti. You could either raise hey. your hand. Oh, I heard it. I heard it. I heard an eye. Uh, Fran Arsenault. Aye. Uh, okay. Aye. Dean Charter. Aye. Jim Snyder Grant says aye. And how about you, David Martin? Aye. Okay. We're unanimous on that one. And now, unless someone has something, I will take a motion to adjourn. Please. I don't so move. Seconds. Okay. Uh, second. D Dean moves. <laughs> Jim seconds. Uh, uh, Jim, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Um, Himogen Agaretti. Aye. Fran Arsenault. Aye. Dean Charter. Aye. Jim Snyder Grant says aye. And how about you, Dean Martin? David uh, David Martin. Dean Martin is a different person. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, I would say aye. Okay. We're we're adjourned, uh, just in time. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you.